Uh, so, uh, so as you as you heard, uh, I'm now the author of several books, and uh, this talk is based on my most recent book, Remembering God's Mercy: Redeem the Past and Free Yourself from Painful Memories. And now, one reviewer uh, said that the subtitle's a bit misleading because this book isn't so much about freeing yourself from painful memories. You know, we live in an age of recycle, recycling. You know, it's not good to just throw stuff away. Uh, so we repurpose things. And I think that reviewer is right that this, that this book is uh, really about repurposing those painful memories, learning how to see even the darkest moments of our lives in the light of Christ. Uh, now, what I'm going to share with you is a, a method of prayer that I've discovered that has helped me personally in the healing of, of memories. And this um, may be a, a bit different from, uh, from what you've heard about. Uh, some of you uh, may be familiar uh, with a, a popular um, approach to healing of memories called uh, inner healing. Can I see uh, uh, who of you have heard of inner healing? So a number of hands. Uh, well, uh, well, inner inner healing um, is is an approach uh, that that has helped, does help uh, many people, uh, and those who practice it are are you know very on fire uh, for the Lord, uh, Christians who often have you know, devoted really their whole lives to helping people uh, heal. Um, but um, as, as we, we know, uh, it's a big enough church that there is room for, for many different approaches uh, to life in the spirit, and sometimes it's kind of different strokes from di for different folks. You know, like some people may 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 speak in tongues. Some people may have words of prophecy. Some people may just have words of teaching or just contemplation. Well, with ways of healing too, it's different strokes for different folks. Uh, well, I first heard about inner healing when I was first starting to come to terms with my own wounds. Uh, in two, 2007, as a new Catholic, I went to see a Catholic therapist uh, because, uh, because I was having symptoms, which I later learned from a psychiatrist were actually uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, brought on uh, by childhood uh, trauma. Uh, including uh, sexual abuse uh, that, I, that I suffered uh, beginning uh, when I was uh, six years old and, and was uh, molested by uh, a janitor at the temple uh, that my family attended. Uh, so these wounds were manifesting themselves and had really begun to manifest themselves in my teenagehood uh, in what I now know was PTSD. I had symptoms such as uh, flashbacks anxiety, teariness, um, lonely, loneliness um, and despair and heart racing. So in 2007 when I was seeing this Catholic therapist, he suggested that he do inner healing on me, but when he told me what it was, I was afraid. Uh, the, the approach that he said he wanted to take was that I would relive each painful memory and invite Jesus in. Now, I didn't know at the time why I was afraid, and I thought, well, gosh, you know, maybe I just don't have enough faith. And then, you know, if you're already beating up on yourself, if you start beating up on yourself for then not having enough faith, that's just what the enemy wants. He wants to keep us uh, just um, just in, in, our, um, in our despair. But I now know that that's not why I was afraid of inner healing. It wasn't lack of faith. Not that, uh, not that I couldn't, you know, always use more faith. We all need those gifts of the Spirit. But the reason why I was afraid was because when inner healing helps people, it helps people most who have just one painful memory. Just one memory that if they can bring Jesus into it, they'll be fine. My problem
problem was that I had what's known as complex uh, PTSD that came about through several different incidents of abuse and other traumas uh, that, I, that I suffered. Um, and so if I tried to relive one memory, it would be entangled or enmeshed with these other memories. And so I'd have to invite Jesus in one memory, then I'd have to invite him in another and another and another. And you know, who knows when it would end. So I needed something else. I needed some other way of bringing my memories into the light of Christ. And I found that way through one of the great treasures of our, of our church's kind of library of spirituality. You know, we, we have Dominican spirituality, Carmelite spirituality. Uh, certainly we have all kinds of charismatic spiritualities. These are all gifts of the church. And the particular gift that spoke to my heart with respect to healing was the gift of Jesuit spirituality, the spirituality of St. Ignatius Loyola, founder of the Jesuits, who uh, developed a series of spiritual exercises, uh, exercises of contemplation, imaginative contemplations, uh, where, you, where you imagine yourself really walking with Jesus during his earthly life and through his, his passion and, and death and resurrection. And the reason why this helped me was because, but for me, healing was not about inviting Jesus into the mysteries of my life. It was about inviting myself into the mysteries of Jesus' life. Because the mysteries of, of my, my life, they're, they're, um, they're, they're finite, they're, 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 they're limited. You know, if I think back too much into the past, it's like hitting a wall. But the mysteries of Jesus' life, Jesus is God and man, and Jesus is our salvation. And he has, just like we see in that divine mercy image, he has this, this heart that we know in the litany of the sacred heart, as we uh, prayed on that feast day uh, just, uh, just last week, Jesus' Jesus' heart is in an abyss of love. Um, in, in, the, in the mysteries of my life, so to speak, there's a pain where if you look inside evil, you'll never get to the bottom of it because evil is a, is a black hole. But Jesus' heart is like a doorway into this universe of light and love. And you can never get to the bottom of the mystery of Jesus' sacred heart because it's a mystery that never ends, a mystery of eternal life with him. All the mysteries of my life, of my um, pain, that is, um, go down, but Jesus' mysteries are, are going upwards and lifting me up with them. So that message of Ignatian spirituality is what I share. And so uh, for the next um, 20, uh, 25 minutes or so, uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, St. Ignatius Loyola said that, that sermons should have three points. So I'm going to give you a kind of three-point talk. And two of the points are going to come from Remembering God's Mercy, where I'll share with you two prayers that uh, were dear to St. Ignatius Loyola, and these prayers have become dear to me. And for the third uh, point, uh, and the, fin the final point, I'll share with you something from this little unpublished book. This is the book of my notes from the last Ignatian retreat that I made, where I received an insight through praying on scripture. And then after that third point, I'll be, uh, I'll be delighted to answer your questions. And then uh, after uh, the evening comes to a close, uh, I'll be in the sacristy. I'll have books available for sale for anyone who would like to purchase one. And I'll also um, be delighted to meet you, you know, whether or not you're, whether or not you're purchasing a, a book. Uh, so so first, uh, the first prayer that I'll share with you. So, 
so um, this prayer that I'll share with you is a prayer that's not only uh, dear to Ignatius, but it's also dear to Pope Francis. Uh, and in fact, the way that I enter into Ignatius of Loyola's spirituality in remembering God's mercy is through the spirituality of Pope Francis, our first Jesuit Pope. And it was actually Francis who really inspired this book because I was reading an interview with him. It was his first major interview after he became Pope. And uh, he was asked uh, about uh, how, how does he pray? And Francis answered, prayer for me is always a prayer full of memory, of recollection, even the memory of my own history. For me, it is the memory of which St. Ignatius speaks in the first week of the exercises in the encounter with the merciful Christ crucified. Uh, and then he goes on saying, it is the memory of which Ignatius speaks uh, in the, in, in, in the uh, prayer for obtaining divine love when he asks us to recall the gifts we have received. So Francis mentions these two prayers, both from the exercises, and uh, he uh, says that his prayers are prayers full of memory. And, and this you know, fascinated me because I was already beginning to take my memory into prayer. And I realized that if I followed Francis's advice and took my memory into the two prayers that he mentions, that that could bring even greater uh, healing. Uh, so the first prayer that he mentions when he speaks of an, the encounter with the merciful Christ crucified, that's a prayer called the Anima Christi. Some of you may have prayed it before. Do any of you know that the Anima Christi? Oh good, a, a number of you. Well, the Anima Christi isn't a prayer that St. Ignatius of Loyola uh, wrote, uh, but it's a prayer that is often identified with Ignatius because he uses it so much in the, the spiritual exercises. Because this is a prayer that really draws us into, into the mystery of our union with Christ, the union that we have with Jesus through our baptism, through our, through our confirmation, through every time we receive the Eucharist, every time we receive Jesus in confession, every time we pray and read scriptures, we, we renew the graces of, of our baptism. And the Anna Christi um, speaks to that, especially with respect to the Eucharist. It, the Anna Christi is actually recommended uh, in, in uh, I believe, the Roman Missal, if I'm not mistaken, in the book that that uh, that the um, that the priest uh, uses, the, the official prayers of the Church. Uh, the Anna Christi is recommended specifically for praying after communion. Uh, so. Uh, so uh, the, the prayer goes, soul of, uh, soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O oh, good Jesus, hear me. Within thy wounds, hide me. Suffer me not to be separated from thee. From the malicious enemy, defend me. In the hour of death, call me. And bid me come unto thee, that with thy saints I may praise thee forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, the first thing we notice about this prayer is that it's a prayer that bespeaks intense intimacy with Christ. It's, it's this, it, 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 sh it shares with us, it conveys to us this intimacy that's real, it's physical, it's in flat and fleshed. And at the same time, the images, the imagery of the Anima Christi, it doesn't stop at Jesus' humanity. It, it uses Jesus' humanity to raise us up to contemplating his divinity, the 
divine life that he came here to, uh, to share with us through his passion, death, and resurrection, the Paschal Mystery, as we call it. We call it the Paschal Mystery after Passover, uh, because it was Jesus passing over um, into the, the resurrected life. Um, so uh, so the, the key part, really the, at the heart of the Alma Christi is this line, within thy wounds hide me. Uh, in Latin, it's intra tua vulnera, absconde me. Vulnera is the Latin word for wounds. That's where we get vulnerable. Well, for me, uh, for me, when I was first uh, beginning to seek healing uh, from the effects of my PTSD, you know, my overriding feeling was one of vulnerability. Uh, and it wasn't a happy feeling of vulnerability. It was this um, feeling of, of fear and, and um, and, and sadness and, you know, those other negative emotions that I listed uh, earlier. Uh, and so what this um, Christie prayer does is it takes me out of my wounds, takes my mind off of my wounds, and puts my mind on Jesus' wounds. And it gives me that beautiful image of hiding in his wounds. Those wounds that, as you see in the Divine Mercy image, are radiating divine light. Uh, the way that Pope Francis puts it, uh, this, this was when he was the Jesuit superior in Argentina, he told his fellow Jesuits that in the Animal Christi, St. Ignatius places us in contact with the Lord's sanctifying body in such a way that we are hidden in his wounds and thus have our own wounds and sores healed. So, to put it another way, uh, some of you uh, may have heard of the singer Leonard Cohen. Anyone familiar with Leonard Cohen? A few of you, yes. Um, you might know his song, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Well, Leonard Cohen also wrote uh, a song in which he, he sang, there's a crack, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And in, and in this case, and whereas the wounds in my own wounded heart are wounds of emptiness and darkness, Jesus' wounds, the, the heart of, uh, of his that was pierced by the centurion's lance, his, his wound has it has this radiance that you see, it radiates light. And the beautiful healing truth is that if I place my wounded heart next to the wounded and risen heart of Jesus, his wounds heal mine. I, particularly if I pray after receiving the Eucharist, or after making confession, if I, if I pray, Jesus, send the light from your wounds, send the light from your sacred, glorified heart, send that light into the wounds of my heart, then I can be filled with Jesus' light, filled with his love. And this is the really amazing thing. It's something worth contemplating. Pause for dramatic effect here. <laughs> the, the mystery is that if I had not suffered those wounds, wounds of abuse and trauma, uh, and also the wounds caused by my own sins, which, which certainly should never have happened, and of which I repent, um, but you know, even after repenting, they still, there are still wounds that need to be healed. If I hadn't suffered all, all that, there wouldn't be the space for Jesus to fill. Now don't tell people that I said, go sin to make more space for Jesus. That's not <laughs> what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that there is no
no evil that, that we've done of which we, we repent, and there's no evil that was done to us that is beyond our Lord's saving grace, the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. And, and this brings me to, to the second point, which is the other prayer uh, that... Um, that uh, Pope Francis mentions that is a prayer full of memory for him. He speaks of the uh, memory of the contemplation to attain divine love. Uh, this is a prayer from the final week of the spiritual exercises. Uh, St. Ignatius Loyola wrote the spiritual exercises to be prayed over a 30-day uh, period. And so after 30 days of silent prayer and and contemplation and, you know, meeting with your spiritual director every day and just every day inviting, inviting God to show you, to enlighten you. Um, you know, after that, if, if you've been really putting your heart into the exercises, by then you really want to give something back to God. And by then you really know that all you can give back to God is all that he's given you. Um, but that's what he wants. He wants our heart. Um, so this, um, this prayer uh, is one that was written by Ignatius of Loyola himself, and it's called uh, the Sushi Pei, which is from its first uh, word, which means receive in Latin, word or take. And uh, the prayer goes, Take, O Lord, and receive my entire liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my whole will. All that I am and all that I possess, you have given me. I surrender it all to you to be disposed of according to your will. Give me only your love and your grace. With these, I will be rich enough and will desire nothing more. So I want to repeat you the first um, line of the prayer, which is the line that really struck me when I first heard it. Take, Lord, and receive my entire liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my whole will. Now when I first prayed this, when I first read it, it was as a new Catholic, and the part about take, Lord, and receive my entire liberty, I could wrap my mind around that one because I had misused and abused my liberty through a, a sinful life. And so, and so, you know, I was very happy to give my, uh, my liberty to God to say, to say um, thy will, not my will, thy will uh, be done. But then it, it, said, it goes on to, after saying receive my entire liberty, it may just write my memory my understanding, and my whole will. Well, I can understand giving God my, my whole will, and I could try to, you know, picture what it meant to give God my understanding. You know, it means to put on the mind of Christ, like uh, St. Paul uh, exhorts us to do. But that part about my memory, that really um, made me have to stop and think, because I thought, why on earth would God want my memory? You know, why would he want any of my memories? You know, not that I don't have some happy, many happy memories, praise God, but still, you know, the memories that were obsessing me at this time were the painful memories. And I thought, you know, I've been trying to forget these memories and God wants them? <laughs> but of course, the answer is he wants everything. Um, there's a uh, there's a, a line um, from uh, Pope, Pope Francis on this. Uh, Pope Francis says that most of all, he wants to teach us to be more loving. He wants to confirm in us the commitment we have made. And this is what our memory does. For memory is the grace of the Lord's presence in our apostolic lives. Those are the words of, of our Holy Father. Memory is a grace of the Lord's 
presence in our apostolic lives. I can tell you, if you go to the Vatican website, if you go to uh, one of the Vatican news websites, like um, the Vatican radio website, or uh, zenit.org, Z-E-N-I-T, sorry, Z-E-N-I-T.org, which is another Vatican news site. If you just put the word memory in there, you will find all these talks from Pope Francis on memory. His most recent World Youth Day message was on memory. Here he is speaking about memory to youth. How do they have memories? They're young. <laughs> but he's telling them that memory is really, really important. Uh, so, when he says, when Francis says that memory is a grace of the Lord's presence in our apostolic lives, he's taking after St. Ignatius. What our memory tells us, it's not about us, it's about him. It's about what our Lord has, has granted, all the good stuff he wills, I mean, he wills positively, he grants. And, and our memory is also about what the Lord's Permitted the evil that we've done, the evil that others have done, um, the evil caused by original sin, which is you know the evils of sickness and the fact that things break and and corrupt and don't go the way that we want them to. All those things God um, doesn't positively will, but He permits in His divine providence. He chooses not to prevent them because. He wants us to have free will so that we can choose to love him. And, and so everything in our memory is, is a testament to divine providence. And it's that providence that brings us um, not only to happiness with the Lord, the, our eternal happiness, but the providence even brings us to where we are now, even if we're not happy right this moment. I, I speak to all of you here, and I speak also to, to myself. I am happy right now speaking to you, but still, you know, feelings come and go. And I might have, you know, a, a moment at any time when, when I'm not, you know, feeling uh, the, the grace of God. But, um, but thank God, our, the, the grace of God is, is present it's like, it flows like a river, whether we feel it or not. And the point that I'm trying to make is that even if you're not feeling that grace right now, or feeling the effects of that grace, the very fact that you know that there's something that should be there that isn't there, that you know there's something that should be making you happy that isn't, that isn't making you happy now, that is grace. The fact that you feel this God-shaped hole in your heart is grace. Because God doesn't permit any hole to be in your heart that he doesn't intend to fill. He, uh, he only permits those holes so that, he can, so that he can fill them, so that we can be stretched in our hearts and sometimes broken in our, in our, in our, in our hearts. Um, because, the, the, because the, the sacrifice that God wants is a contrite spirit, a humbled, contrite heart. He will not spurn. Can I have an amen? Amen. Yeah, amen. amen. Yes. So, so this is what Fulton J. Sheen called black grace. Fulton Sheen spoke of black grace and white grace. Uh, the image is the image of, 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 of light. Uh, of, of, of darkness versus 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 uh, light, um, and so you know the, the, what Fulton Sheen called white grace is the grace you know you picture the light like from the Sacred Heart where it's uh, what we would normally call grace it's the joy, but what Fulton Sheen called black grace is the grace of that darkness that tells us that we need more of God we need more of the Spirit we. we and, and that's a good thing, because in the spiritual life, there is no maintenance mode. There's no stagnation in the spiritual life. You're either going up or you're going down. And so if we're feeling that need for God, that's just a sign that, that we need to keep praying 
keep seeking to bring our wounds to the sacred heart because he wants to keep filling us and to raise us up. Amen? Amen. 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 Um, Amen. So I'm going to share with you that one last uh, last point and then I'll be and then I'll be delighted to take your questions. So the last point is from uh, a, 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 a retreat that I made. Uh, it was the most recent spiritual exercises retreat uh, that I made earlier this year. Uh, I didn't do the whole 30 days, but I did. I managed to do a compressed version of the retreat. And one of the meditations that I was given was a meditation on, uh, on John uh, chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. And this is, uh, this is where uh, St. Thomas uh, uh, says, says those words that make us call him a daddy Thomas. Um, it's the passage, I'll start with verse 24 in John 20. It says, now Thomas, so this is after the resurrection, after Jesus has appeared to the, to, to the disciples, but... Thomas wasn't there with them at that time when he first when Jesus appeared. And so we're told now Thomas, one of the twelve, called one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. The doors were shut, but Jesus came and stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not be faithless, but believing. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, You have believed because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's all of us. Um, so, uh, so when I was praying on this, you know, we read these passages, and I've read that passage, you know, so many times, and we think we've gotten everything that could be gotten out of it, but I was really surprised as I was praying this that something came up that I had never noticed before, and it was something, a message that, uh, that the Holy Spirit wanted to give me. Uh, I know it's a message from the Holy Spirit because it brought me joy, and that's a, that's a sign uh, of, the, of, the, of the Spirit, joy in contemplating holy things. So I noticed, and here I'm reading to you from my notes, that whereas um, when Thomas speaks, when Thomas speaks about wanting to see Jesus' hands, Thomas is kind of obsessed with the print of the nails. He repeats it. He says, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. Um, so, so, you know, he's hyper-focused on the nail print, like the way that I, uh, when I'm suffering from the effects of PTSD, can get hyper-focused on the way that the you know, knife seems to be twisted in my heart because of some memories. But what does Jesus say? He says, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not be faithless, but believing. So this is what amazed me to realize that to Jesus, it's not, oh, here's the mark of the nails, and here's me. It's, here's my hand. Jesus doesn't separate the wound from his identity. Instead, instead, the, he's, 
taken this wound, which is not a wound caused by anything he's done. It's a wound. It's it's a wound caused by by me um, to him. You know, me as a as a, as as a, as, a, as a sinner. My my sins nailed him to the cross, and and yet uh, he in his forgiveness of of me has turned this very wound into a thing of beauty so that the beauty of his wounds can't be separated from who he is. So when I started to contemplate that, I thought, what does that mean for me and my wounds? Instead of being so focused on this evil thing that was done to me and this evil thing that was done and this evil thing that I did that I can't change even though I've repented of it. Instead of focusing on what I've done, I need to think about what Jesus Christ did and what he is doing and what he still does for us at every Mass when, when, when he represents his own sacrifice through the Mass. And when I think about, about that, then I can really, really um, begin to, to say, like we say at every Easter vigil, we hear it in the Exultet prayer, the Easter candle, um, the, the, the Easter candle chant. I can say, oh, happy thought that, uh, that here Jesus took the sin of Adam and every sin and, and my sin and made something beautiful out of it, that he came to, to save me, for, both from my sins and from the effects of all the sins committed against me. And when I start to think that, then if my sin still bleed, so to speak, or my wounds still bleed, I mean, my, my sins can't really still bleed if I've repented of them, but the wounds that I've received from them, the effects, of things that I can't change and still believe, kind of like stigmata. There, you know, we can get a sort of emotional or spiritual stigmata from the um, the wounds. Well, any any unhealed wound that's still there no longer can take me away from Jesus. It can only draw me closer because his wounds still flow, but they flow because they radiate. And what does that really mean for me? Well, what it really means is that any wound that I have is meant to teach me to love more, to teach me to love Jesus more and to love others more. And if I can do that, then I can pray for for everyone else who has been wounded. And we've all been wounded in, in some in, in some in some way. Uh, and uh, and so uh, it um, it becomes a a way in which I can, like Jesus, become a wounded healer. And we all can do that. You don't have to stand in front of a microphone to do that. You can be a wounded healer through praying uh, for others, and your wound gives you more empathy, more of a feeling for people. You know, this is why Jesus had such harsh words for the Pharisees, because they were claiming they were without sin, and so without wounds, and so they couldn't feel for the people who were wounded. Um, but, but, we, but we have this grace of union with Christ, not in spite of our wounds, but in and through our wounds. That's where Jesus wants to meet, it, meet us. That's where he wants to reach us with his, with his love and his grace. Can I hear an amen? Amen. 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 Well, thank you so much. You, you've been a wonderful audience. I'll be delighted to, to answer any questions that you have. God bless you. So if you have any questions, if you could just raise, raise your, your hand. <laughs> well, you know, just something right along with what you said, I just, uh, I can remember ministering uh, in, in post-abortion healing to women and men, 
and, and a woman you shared with me having suffered abuse and, and a couple of abortions and many disappointments, she said, I've discovered in my life that when I meditate upon my sins and my failures and my disappointments and my suffering, I become miserable. But when I meditate upon His and I bring mine to Him, something beautiful happens. Amen. And, and so just what you're saying is uh, exactly what she was saying uh, in terms of her experience, that how God takes the stuff we want and just get rid of it. And God says, no, 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 don't throw that away. <laughs> right. I need that. I need that. So, Repurpose it, yes. And then the world's best recycler. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. Thank you. Uh, any any questions? If I don't see a hand, maybe someone can point out to me where the hands are. I see a hand back back there in the green shirt, is that right? Okay. I guess the microphone will come, come to you. Thanks. Uh, what about you to writing books? How did I start writing books? Yeah, how did you start writing books? Uh, well, I started by having a website called The Dawn Patrol, <laughs> which you can still find. It's online at Dawn Eden, that's D A W N E D E N dot blogspot dot com. And I was a new Christian at that time, I wasn't yet Catholic, and I was writing about. Um, about my challenges in trying to learn how to be chased, how to how to save myself for for marriage, um, because uh, I did not have experience in chastity, <laughs> and I, in in writing about about that, um, I, uh, I I came into contact with with the publisher. Uh, and uh, and this pub this publisher um, asked me if I if, if I had an idea for for a book, and I, I uh, pitched this to the, to them, and they and they liked it. They went for it because at that time there were lots of books out there on uh, teen abstinence. On there were lots of books on how to stay a virgin till marriage, but there weren't books for those of us whose uh, train had left the station, so to speak. <laughs> and so, um, so that became my first book, The Thrill of the Chaste. Uh, the subtitle is Finding Fulfillment While Keeping Your Clothes On. And, uh, and that came out first in a Protestant edition, and then uh, I, wrote, I rewrote it a couple of years ago in a Catholic edition, which is the one that I have uh, for sale here. And then after writing The Thrill of the Chase, I wanted to write on healing because in my talks on chastity, many of the people whom I, whom I met um, who had difficulties with chastity were people who were um, seeking love through sexual union. And they were seeking love through sex uh, because they um, because they had these wounds from their past, so they felt that they weren't valuable unless they gave themselves away. And I, that was something that I could really relate to, and I felt was important to write about that. Uh, and by this time, I was a Catholic, and uh, one thing you know, that really concerned me was the fact that as Catholics, I noticed that even though there was talk about about the clergy abuse crisis, um, you know, and, and just the fallout from the from uh, from uh, from the actions of uh, a few um, a few bad apples, sadly. Um, there wasn't talk in the Catholic Church about healing for those of us who had suffered abuse other than by clergy, and uh, or, and the thing is that most abuse um, takes place. In the home, and we're speaking of, of, of abuse of, ch of children, uh, it, it is it is most often committed either by a family member or by a neighbor or a playmate, someone with a with with access to the child in the home. And I thought, well, 
this is something that that where we have, you know, if you look at the statistics that say one out of four women, one out of six men suffered childhood sexual abuse, I think those statistics are very low, by the way, then we've got people on every pew in every church who have these wounds, and we as a church, you know, if, if we are truly to be, like Pope Francis says, a, a field hospital, we need to be out there ministering to these people. So the idea, the angle that I came up with was to write a book on of stories of saints who suffered childhood sexual abuse and found healing in Christ. And as I started researching, I found there were many saints who suffered abuse in childhood, uh, including sexual abuse. And I knew from my own experience that it's healing to hear their stories because the most painful wound from childhood abuse uh, is the wound of misplaced guilt. The child tends to blame himself or herself. Um, and, and of course, you know, the, the truth is you know, just the opposite. No child is ever responsible uh, for the abuse committed against him or her. Even if the abuse was committed by a peer, children are just not capable of making a mature decision about sex sexual contact. So uh, the book that I wrote became My Peace I Give You, Healing Sexual Wounds with the Help of the Saints. And uh, I found that, that book you know, became very popular. There was a real need for it. It's been translated into Spanish, Polish, also um, Slovak. Um, and then readers of My Peace I Give You asked me to write an, another book that they could give to friends and family who hadn't been abused, but had perhaps other painful memories, and that's where, and, that, and that's how I came to write Remembering God's Mercy. So, uh, a long answer to your, to your short question, but thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about my different books. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Oh, I think the microphone's coming to you. Thanks. Uh, this would have to do with your own personal journey. You, you mentioned that you entered Christianity uh, at, in evangelical uh, Christianity before you became a Catholic. Yes, yes, that's that's right. When I first I uh, received the the grace of conversion through, through this um, conversion experience, I was determined to be ABC, anything but Catholic, <laughs> because I was not a joiner. I had been a rock and roll journalist, a nonconformist, and you know, like they say, I didn't want to be part of a club that would have me for a member. I wanted to pick the church that fit in with my personal idea of what a church should, should be like, and that wouldn't challenge me. So I kept searching for a church that wouldn't challenge me, and uh, I found lots of you know, churches with nice people and nice hymns and stuff, but I still felt this hole, this emptiness. And, um, and you know, it took five years for me to come around to Catholicism, but I'll, I'll tell you, you know, and, well, in order to hear the whole story, since I don't want to keep people here that all night, you can go to YouTube and look for Dawn Eden Journey Home, because I did tell this whole story on Marcus Broda's The Journey Home on EWTN. But I will tell you that what really drew me into the Catholic Church was the Catholic Church's pro-life witness. Mm -hmm. Because because I began to learn that the church, the Catholic Church, whereas other, whereas, whereas a Protestant denominations may or may not choose to be pro-life. They could change their teaching at any time, but the Catholic Church has the pro-life witness as part of its identity for 2,000 years. And more than that, as, as, as a survivor of abuse, when I saw how the Catholic Church values the life of every every child, born and, and un unborn, I realized that if the Catholic Church's teachings were followed, 
my, I will have been treasured as, as, as a child by every person, not only by, by, by my family, but by the other people I encountered, not all of whom were good people. Uh, so, you know, whereas, you know, for some people who just read um, media reports and just read about the bad stuff, they might be shocked to think, well, how can you say that as an abuse victim you feel most at home in the church? You know, the truth is that, you know, for those who know the church's teachings, if everyone lived by what the Catholic Church teaches, this, this would be a, a much safer wor world with everyone valued and treasured. Thank you. Um, so, do we have time for one more? I, mean, I don't want to keep us here to, too long. And tell me. Okay, I guess we do. <laughs> one, one last question. Um, as a survivor of abuse, um, what advice would you give to someone to get on that path of healing? Thank you for, ask, for asking. Uh, that's, a, that's a very important question. To get on the path of healing, um, this, is, this is something I talk about uh, particularly in uh, my piece I give you. At the end of it, I have a resource guide for, uh, for survivors. And uh, I believe that people who suffered uh, abuse, particularly childhood sexual abuse, need healing both of the, uh, of the, of the, of the soul and of the mind and, and, and body. Um, so, you know, for the mind and body, you know, this means uh, seeing, seeing a good therapist, meaning a qualified therapist, not just a therapist where someone says, oh, this person's Catholic, this person will be faithful. You know, that, that's good. It is great to have a faithful therapist, but also look at the piece of paper on the wall and make sure that the person has the degree from the right place. Um, but also, also, you know, people who suffer abuse may need to get physical help because often um, abuse can, for, for a child who suffered abuse, there may be physical manifestations because of the way that abuse affects the hormones of a developing child. And, and sometimes, you know, people who suffer abuse can be accused of being hypochondriacs, and I don't deny that some of us are, but, um, but really, uh, it is important for them to, um, if they have different complaints, like many have um, fibromyalgia, you know, kind of pain complaints, to get the right kind of treatment for that as well. Uh, but most of all, most of all, without discounting uh, medical and psychiatric help, most of all, we need spiritual help. For me, that meant finding a good spiritual director here at, at St. Days, uh, I have to say, you're so blessed not only to have uh, a number of, of, of priests, wonderful priests, also to have uh, the CFRs nearby, the, the, Franci the Franciscans of the, of, of the Renewal. Um, and where you have a house of religious, you're generally more likely to find not only uh, priests, but also priests who have time because sometimes I ask the priest because of all their obligations, if it may not have enough time to see someone for spiritual direction on a regular basis. But, but that spiritual direction, also good spiritual reading, and daily mass, day, and you know, daily Eucharist, and confession, those things made the biggest difference in my life. So thank you so much, and thanks to all of you. Christ uh, in, in poverty. So thank you all and God bless you.